Hi there, it's Polly here. <laughs> With our old pal Mr. Snoots. <laughs> yes, and so I am here to talk about something I guess I should have covered before. Morkborg. Okay, and we will need to drink. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right, so Morkborg. Um, now, this is a splendid piece of work, but it's it's dark. It's like... Normally, I like covering relatively cheerful things. However, this is brilliant, brilliant, brilliant work. So, needs to be covered. This is by Freer Ligon. Now, I, I have noticed that our friends in Sweden have a habit of writing some pretty dark games. This is about as dark as it comes, as you can see from the cover. But this has spawned almost a genre of, of borgs. Um, and so I think it's a really important piece of work. Uh, I've already covered, I think, Pirate Borg on this. I have a bunch of others on order because um, I do actually love what they do. But, so you'll see, it's a small um, digest size hardcover. It's not that thick, but these things have an entire game's world in them. And this is what makes them run. It's a very interesting piece of work. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that these things, it's all about the page layout. So, like, everything they do, very minimal written information on the page, but the artwork is actually delivering the message. It's giving you the, um, it's giving you the geist to the thing. It is often delivering the information, but most of all, it's just giving you the setting. And, um, so it's, it's a very brilliant piece of, of work. Um, some other companies have tried copying this, some of those extremely badly. Uh, I love like Gabriel Quiroga's work, which is brilliant. Uh, I've done some reviews of his stuff. Check that out. He, he is probably the master of this. But these guys have done a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant job. That's a goblin, by the way. I love it. Goblin shark goblins. So what's this at its core? Okay, engine-wise, it's very simple, you know. Whee! Mr. Snoots approves. It's a fantasy game, and this fantasy game uses a very, very simplified sort of D20, D&D-esque sort of system. You have characteristics. Now, these are rolled on 3D6, but it's just to give you a range of dice bonuses. Negative 3 through to 0 through to plus 3. So you roll the characteristics, but all you bother to do is record the bonus numbers. The actual 3d6 roll discarder, it's never used again. And you have um, essentially hit points. When those hit points get to zero, you know, you, well, you uh, are out of it when it gets to negatives, you drop dead. You're rolling d20 against a difficulty class. So these are very simple mechanisms that we all know. Now, a vital shift in this game is that the umpire does not roll dice and so forth in combat. These are rolled by the characters. So you have a um, essentially a strength characteristic which is used and you're going to be rolling against that to hit. So I think it's a difficulty 12 or higher, modified by your characteristic. You're rolling that on a d20 or higher to hit. But when you are being attacked, you roll to avoid your character taking damage. So you do an agility roll to avoid it. Now, the, the dynamic shift on that, and uh, this is approved by Mr. Smooth, Snoot's more psychotic uh, friend, Mr. Nar. <laughs> Um, is that there's no fudging. The umpire, you know, rolling behind a screen. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, the sky's low on hit points. Oh, I missed. No. Out there on the table, the character's player will be rolling to see if the character is hit and how much damage the character takes. So there's no fudging. And there's kind of like a philosophical shift in that, in that you kind of are the pilot of your own doom. Umpire didn't kill you. You failed the agility roll. D6 damage. <sighs> yep. You managed to max the damage out. You killed yourself. So yeah, it's so. And this is part of the doom of the whole thing. As you can see, this game has 
very much a doom and gloom feel to it and that's what it is the other part of this that works in tandem is the feel we start that immediately when you when you open these are the um this is the cover facing pages we've got um the corpse plundering table um traps and deviltry and um uh occult treasures just facing you corpse plundering what you find death mask of one of the pcs um bloodstained knuckle dusters weighted dice mapped to a weak but wealthy family's house this sort of thing traps and deviltry you know general well-dressed corpse booby trapped scorpion filled basket poised to fall and the one you gotta love what is it fish hooks hanging at eye level so immediately there you haven't even reached page one this is way nastier than Dungeons and Dragons it's just got a vicious edge and that's kind of what they've gone for in the whole thing this is a world that is ending it is doomed it is dying everything is just going to shite um you've got a limited world which has actually been depicted in this really interesting sort of map graphic these are described each of these places is accursed and the walls are closing in. There's been these horrific deities, these double-headed sort of basilisks. And there's a gospel of sort of the babblings of some of these. And they are just predicting the doom of the world. And these predictions are just coming true one after another. Everything's dying. Everything's miserable. And this is kind of why this isn't a game that I would run. I absolutely would not. Uh, and I probably, I probably wouldn't play it either. Because the thing is... The whole area, the world's ending horribly in pain and despair and blood and mutilation and you just there's nothing you can do about it. So why not just kill and murder and rob and just steal some stuff before it all ends? You know, this is the this is the game. You you know, as a little sidebar note, week you could change things so that maybe the characters could be the ones that somehow solve things. Not bloody likely. And we'll get into that as we get into the character classes and all these sorts of things. But essentially what happens is each of these sort of generalized locations of the game is well written up. They're all horrifying. Um, mausolea and screaming madmen. One of them's a city where the the beloved King Ruler just, just knows how horrifying is coming. So he's basically got all of the population psyched up into a suicide cult. And yes, the idea is you know, the entire city, they're just going to literally pour over a cliff like lemmings soon just to avoid the true horrors that are coming in the very final end days. They're going to cheat it by all suiciding. You know, all these plays describing your corpses hanging from nooses off every tree and like, oh my God. Yeah, not, not, a, not a game to play if you're in any way depressed. But... Um, so you wander through this bleak, bleak landscape as days pass there's like a d66 chart that you roll on which has you know the events foretold the things that are happening done in wonderfully mystic terms so you know a great betrayal begins um you know the uh, um the plagues in this area you know the dead begin to rise shrieking um all these sorts of things and you roll for how long it lasts and the the Players actually, before you roll, the players first decide how long the next condition lasts. They, um, it could be a hundred years, it could be, um, you know, a d6 hours. But, and then the umpire rolls on this chart and will randomly come up with something horrible that's happening. Be it, you know, rains of blood or, you know, um, um, <sighs> blowflies with the faces of golden retrievers, whatever. But you keep rolling and you mark it and no effect can happen three times so you sort of you move on and when you've crossed off all the list so when you've done everything there twice you move on to the last one where the world just ends so d66 36 so you have 72 days you got less than three months and the world will end that's it and it will probably get you long before there as, you know, the skies and whatever turn toxic. So 
Um, yeah, I, I mean, there, there is a certain urge to ask um, the designers if everything's okay at home, like seriously. So, um, damage on weapon, like, I love this. Um, we've got like, <laughs> you know, weapon charts. Uh, <laughs> just everything's done in the most horrible possible way. Um, but characters, you can take a sort of a generic character, in which case when you're rolling three dice for each of the characteristics, you roll four dice and take the best three. Or you can choose specific classes. There are six classes in the book, and these classes are horrible. Absolutely bloody horrible. Um, you have things like, um, was it Fanged Deserter? Uh, where for some reason you got fangs and uh, you roll for your um, you roll for your origins. So I've always got an origin, you know. Oh, you came from a brothel here. A burnt black building is your first memory. Was this home? Um, suckling a wolf in the wild, Birchen crypts. Um, but this is a very fighter character, and you roll for random um, equipment and so on when you start. And just to give you the geist again, yes, you could get wizard teeth. Four wizard teeth rattle within a blackened pouch before battle roll a d6 for each one for every six. One of your attacks will do maximum damage. Or my particular favourite one, God, the brown scimitar of Galgenbeck, a stinking sword you pulled from a military shit ditch, d6 damage, dr10 attack and defence while you wield it, so that's better than the usual 12. One in six chance a wounded enemy is smitten with potent sepsis dying in 10 minutes. Isn't this lovely? Um, Gutterborn Scum, which is sort of a, a thiefy stab in the back class. And you get like, um, oh, stealth. And this one you can dodge death and these sorts of things, which is kind of neat. Uh, it's bad birth or whatever. I love this one. Oh, God, help us. Mother hanged from a tree outside of Galgonbeck. You fell from the corpse. So... This is what we're dealing with here as character classes. Um, wretched royalty fleeing from ruined kingdoms, heretical priests screaming in the wilderness, um, occult necromancers. Uh, these are your choice player character classes. Likewise, the things that you run up against as creatures, like I mentioned the goblin, which is brilliant. I love the goblin shark face. I know just tackle out, but so yeah, all goblins carry a curse. Once like you, they're trapped in a prison of their crazed goblin flesh. Only their eyes reveal the truth. A ruined mind is writhing in this body prison, performing terrible deeds. So, basically, you've got a normal person, or well, normal as anyone gets here, trapped inside this body, which is doing horrible things. Um, but if a goblin attacks you, like fires an arrow at you, whether it hits or not, all that matters is the hate directed towards you. You are now cursed. If you don't find that goblin and kill it, you will start slowly, you will start turning into a goblin. What is it in the next? You must find and kill the goblin before your mind is paralyzed. If the curse carrying creature still lives 1d6 days after the attack, your mind is paralyzed, you turn into one of these things and you get to just be a paralyzed mind wandering around in this psychopathic murdering body. Lovely, lovely. Um, magic is done as scrolls that you can get cursed scrolls and you can get sort of sacred scrolls which are also fairly unpleasant but these give you um, specific powers that you can use it could be teleporting it could be um, damage and again often like the capillaries of your targets heads burst and all sorts of wonderful horrible things um, demon of capillaries one creature suffocates for 1d6 rounds um, Foul psychopathy, summon skeletons and zombies. Death, all creatures within 30 paces of you lose 40, 10 hit points. But you roll to activate. If you fail, there is a uh, occult failure chart. And um, again, it's full of all sorts of hideous things. I liked, like one of these, your skeleton is possessed by some unearthly force and will do anything to kill you and escape. Drowning or piercing is preferred so that the bones are completely intact and unharmed. Um, whenever there is some kind of stressful situation or you take, um, or you're in a combat, you have to roll and your skeleton might try and betray you. Um, so, 
your skeleton is fighting you. There's another one where where the magical arcane failure has taken place. The cyst forms in the ground, which turns into a cocoon, which eventually makes swipe to the surface in a few days. A clone of the person who failed the magic test bursts out of this cocoon and then runs off and starts performing hideous, hideous crimes. So you, the player character, you suddenly find that you know you're you're hunted by people and you know law enforcement and, and revenge for stuff that you're not doing. And every one d six days, another one of these psychopathic clones of yours spits out until you find the sodding um, cocoon and destroy it. So. Yeah, so it's nightmarish. Um, you know how you often roll for um, things like what does your uh, what does your character look like and so on. You have an option of doing that in this game, um, and uh, yeah, it's horrible. You 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 can be covered with pustules. You can have one hand that's just you know rotted to piece. Your face is just a rotting mass. You have to wear a mask. You know, it's like oh God. Help us. Uh, but that's what this is. That's what you're getting into when you play this. That's what it is. Um, we've got, you know, psychopathic berserkers. And, you know, again, the, the artwork in this is brilliant. And it really does bring it to life. You know, it's it's a beautiful piece of work. Uh, it's a fantastic piece of macabre fiction. Um, so this is a game for creating these macabre weird adventures like i said the system itself is kept incredibly simple um so just that d20 rolls the umpire does not roll for attack and damage the player has to try and save their own character from terrible things happening to them there's lots and lots and lots of tools in here for the umpire uh, to just generate this horrible world around them um, and um, so, you know, it, it just really hands this incredibly workable campaign straight into the hands of an umpire. So, um, and we have a, uh, there's a adventure here in the back and, um, you know, it's a good one, um, inevitably a horrible one, but, you know, so you can just kick it straight off book in hand. It takes the umpire, you'll probably spend a couple of hours reading it, possibly kind of really dwelling on it because it's actually such a great piece of work. <sighs> Players don't need to know really anything. You can just sink them straight in. So this is a pick up and play. There are a ton of adventures and so on out for this. And if you go into drive through, you find a lot of people have written for this because, you know, it's such a good idea. Um, so, you know, the strengths of this I think this is a, a stunningly beautiful piece of work. The game design is very, very brief, incredibly understandable, very robust, and contributes to the doomed feel of the game. Um, it gives you an entire world. It gives it to you in a way that the umpire can very swiftly and easily generate adventures within the world and just make the staggering nightmare of wandering around in this place really come to life. So again, brilliant piece of design work there. The layout being used as the communication tool that brings the feel and mechanics of the game over. Um, this is a beautiful concept and, and beautifully done. The artwork they've chosen is great. So um, it takes you know, it takes you a little bit to decipher some of the pages, which is actually good. It means you sort of, it actually does mean you absorb the information. So this is a, a great style for laying out books. So the book in itself is an art piece, which is, you know, fantastic. So, you know, this is a great piece of design work, truly a great piece of design work. Um, so, you know, hats off to them. If you're a games designer, um, you need this. You need this to look over and ask yourself why they made the decisions that they did and how they went about it, because this is a great teaching moment for you, know, you as a designer. If you're just a collector, this is a must have. Um, and if you're a player, look, um, and yeah, I keep saying I probably won't run it. Uh, I wouldn't. The group I have are like fairly upbeat. Um, but 
I might run this at a convention if I just really want to, uh, you know, it's late at night, there's a bunch of brassy sort of overconfident people, it's all right, we'll do Morkborg, and, and we'll just, oh, hey, all right, yeah, you're all doomed, everyone's going to die, let's, let's dance on each other's sticky bones as we do it. Um, that's how it is. It has, as I said, spawned a genre of Borgs. Now, these tend to be games that use this core system, that very, very simplified stripped down D20 system with roles done entirely by players, not by the umpires. Um, and they do use these art presentation styles as the way of communicating the game's world. Um, I've reviewed Pirate Borg, which is fantastic. Look for it. It's a great little game. Uh, I've got some others on order that I'm going to do for you. So there's some mecha based ones. There's some punk and heavy metal Borgs, which sound really good. Yeah, there's a ton of these. Many of these are not as doom ridden as this one. Um, many of them are more upbeat, I think. And, you know, I may be proved wrong later. I think the punk one is more like, yeah, smash the state, beat the man. I think, you know, there might be more of a point to it, but um, it's a genre in itself now. And um, it's a very interesting genre. So look, this has been a, um, a hell of a read. It's a wonderful game, it really is. And like I said, well, well worth getting to take a look at how they did it and why they did it. Um, it's been very well regarded and it deserves it. Many games I see are highly lauded and it's like, there's, I look at it as a pro games designer. I look at them and think this game, you know, it doesn't break new ground. It's just another rehashing of someone else's ideas. This does have it at its heart, the the D and D esque D20 thing, but it's taken it and done its own thing with it. And to a state where the, the actual mechanical game system is almost irrelevant. Everything's about sinking you into the world, and that's what it does so well. Whew, drinky poos. Mm -hmm. mm. So, anyway, highly recommended, and just a beautiful piece of work. Can't get over that goblin, that's fantastic. <sighs> How to take a rest. Anyway. Mr. Snoots and I will be back with yet more games, and hell, we'll even bring our insane friend. <clears throat> Hope to see you guys around the games table sometime. Uh, everyone be the best ambassadors for your hobby that you can, and hopefully I'll see you around a games table someday soon. Okay, cheers everyone.